name is Noelle Kern. I am Administrative Manager at 171 Cedar Arts Center. Good morning. I'm Jess Labrisi. I'm the Board Secretary for Elmira Little Theater. And I am Mitchell Hurricane Smith, Marketing and Development Manager for 171 Cedar Arts Center and Board President for Elmira Little Theater. Welcome to the second installment of Virtual, an online series of stories and songs to celebrate the season. We have a great show for you today. We're so excited that 171 and ELT are once again able to partner to provide our community with a little bit of respite and joy this holiday season. So true. Not only do we get to spread cheer to a larger audience, but we also get to celebrate what makes this community so special, unity. Yes, because when we unite rather than fight with our neighbors, anything is possible. Whether we're fighting against the stresses of everyday life or dealing with the global pandemic, it's important to remember that anything is possible when we put our differences aside and work together. And isn't that what the season is all about? I hope you enjoy today's show. I'm excited for this week's musical act. These two were last seen on stage together in Lake Country Players Legally Blonde. Kelsey Johnson and Alex Gill have produced an amazing mashup of We Three Kings and God Rest You Merry Gentlemen. And I want to thank Brooke Yario for providing this week's testimonial for 171. Now, without any further ado, ELT Board Vice President and my friend Alex Dell with his rendition of The Elves and the Shoemaker. Hello, and welcome to another segment of Elmira Little Theater's Virtual, Vir, Virtual, Virtual, Holiday Reading Series. My name is Alex Dell, and I'm the Vice President of Elmira Little Theater. I've been involved at the theater for about three years and have performed both on the stage and helped out behind the scenes. Now, today, I'd like to read you the story of the Elves and the Shoemaker. There once was a good shoemaker who, through a spell of bad luck, had become very poor. Finally, he had just enough leather to make one last pair of shoes. Still, it is a fine piece of leather, said his wife, as soft as butter, yet as strong as your hands. Tonight, dear wife, I will cut the leather, said the shoemaker, and first thing in the morning, I will sew the shoes. The next morning, when the couple went into the workshop, they were flabbergasted by what they found. There on the work table stood two shoes, perfectly finished, not a stitch out of place. But, but who? How? sputtered the shoemaker. His wife could only stare. Just then, a dandy gentleman came into the shop. What magnificent shoes! Please, I must try them on, he said. The shoes fit perfectly. It was as if they had been made just for him. He was so pleased that he paid double the price. Now the shoemaker had enough money to buy leather for two more pairs of shoes. Again that evening, the shoemaker cut out the leather for the shoes and went to bed. And once again, in the morning, there were the shoes, finished. Buyers were not lacking for these either, and, as before, they were so pleased they paid double the price. Now the shoemaker had enough money to buy leather for four more pairs of shoes. The next morning, just as before, there the shoes were already made. On and on it went. Whatever the shoemaker cut out in the evening was finished by morning. Soon the news of these splendid shoes spread throughout the town, and the shoemaker and his wife were no longer poor. One evening, not long before Christmas, as the shoemaker cut the leather for shoes, his wife spoke. Dear husband, who has made us so rich? What if we were to stay up tonight and see who comes to our shop? The shoemaker agreed. So that night, they lit a small lamp in the hall, hid behind their coats, and waited. As the clock struck midnight, they heard the creak of a window and the scuttle of small feet. Peeking out from behind the coats, 
they saw two tiny children sneak into the workshop. They were poorly shod, and they wore only raggedy sacks for warmth. Elves, the shoemaker's wife whispered. The tiny elves tiptoed across the room and climbed onto the table. Then, humming and whistling, they began to stitch and saw and hammer so quickly with their little fingers that the shoemaker and his wife could not believe their eyes. The elves did not stop until all the shoes were finished and stood lined up on the table. Sturdy riding boots, delicate slippers, feather-light dancing shoes, and heavy clogs for work. Then the elves tiptoed out of the workshop, up the stairs, and out the window. The next morning, the wife said, the little elves had made us rich. We must give them something in return. They run around with so little on, they must be freezing. I will make a warm dress, coat and pants, and knit them each a pair of stockings. And I shall be happy to make them each a pair of shoes, said the shoemaker. They went right to work, and that evening they laid the presents on the work table. Then, like before, they hid behind the coats and waited. At midnight, the elves quietly slipped into the shop, ready for another night's work. But instead of pieces of leather, they found the beautiful presents. At first, they were too astonished to move. Then they hugged their new warm clothes and quickly put them on. When they were dressed, they leaped and bounced around the room, singing, now we're elves so fine to see, no longer cobblers we will be. They jumped over the chairs, raced around the shop, and finally ran out the door. The click and clack of their new shoes echoed through the streets. From that time on, the little elves were not seen again. But the shoemaker and his wife lived a long and happy life. Thank you for joining me for the reading of this book, and I hope you have a happy holiday season with your family and your loved ones. My name is Brooke Yorio, and I'm a current senior, class of 2021. I have been coming to 171 since I was a toddler. Right now, um, I've been taking ballet since third grade. That's what I'm taking currently. In elementary school and middle school, I took jazz, tap, and hip hop. Some of my favorite memories at 171 have to be from the story ballets, but most especially the thing that's brought me the most joy is, has been making this senior production video. It's been great seeing all my friends come together. All our years of dance and being compiled into one video that we can look back on. All of our strengths have been highlighted in this and all of our beauty. And it's really been a rewarding experience. Thank you 171 for everything. Thank you Miss Patty. And thank you for everyone else, all the story ballet, moms who have helped, Mrs. Allen, Mrs. Capper, and Mrs. Landry. Thank you so much. God rest you, merry gentlemen, let nothing you dismay. Remember Christ our Savior was born upon this day To save us all from Satan's power when we were gone astray For oh, tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy For oh, tidings of comfort and joy From God our Heavenly Father this blessed angel came and unto certain shepherds brought tidings of the same How that in Bethlehem was born the Son of God by name For oh, tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy For oh, tidings of comfort and joy
proceeding guide us thy perfect light. Story by Carla Kuskin. Illustrations by Robert Andrew Parker. Shall we begin? Every night, the sun sets in the trees at the end of my street. Then, as the dark moves up the block, house lights and street lamps go slowly on. I live in the third house from the corner. If you walk by tonight, you will see the light of two bright candles burning in our menorah. This is the 25th of Keslev, and we are celebrating the first night of Hanukkah. My friend Henry, who lives across the street, has come over to watch us light the candles. Henry has a lot of questions. He wants to know what language menorah comes from and what Keslev means. He knows that Hanukkah is a Jewish holiday. Begin with those words, Hanukkah, menorah, and Keslev. These are Hebrew words. Hebrew is a language that Jews all over the world have spoken for thousands of years. The Old Testament was written in Hebrew. There's even a Hebrew calendar. Keslev is one of the winter months. It comes about the same time as December. Henry admires our menorah. It is a special candelabra, a candle holder with nine spots for candles. It is used only at Hanukkah. My mother and I have polished the brass until it is the color of the setting sun. Your Hanukkah candles and my Christmas lights will shine across the street from each other, Henry says. My mother and I carry the menorah into the living room. My great grandmother brought the menorah with her when she came to this country to live. Now, I hold the match while my mother holds my hand and we light the middle candle together. This candle is called the shamash, which means servant in Hebrew. The shamash is used to light the other candles. Well, that is how it serves them. Tonight, we light just one candle with the shamash. Hanukkah lasts for eight days. Every night, we will light one more candle until on the eighth night, the whole menorah is ablaze. When the flame jumps from one candle wick to the next and rises up in a graceful burning arc, my mother begins to recite the prayers, and I recite them with her. There are three. First, we say a special blessing for the Hanukkah lights. Then there is the blessing for the miracles that happened long ago. And then we say the blessing that is said on the first night of every Jewish holiday. It is called Shashihana. My father comes in, and he and Henry join in on the amens. I can see the two candle flames reflected in my mother's eyes. She has a thoughtful look. We are all quietly waiting. Then she says, a holiday usually celebrates something that happened long ago. And she begins to tell this story. Long ago, in the distant, misted past, 
there was a king named Antiochus Epiphanes. He was very powerful, but he was neither wise nor good. Antiochus ruled many lands, and one of those was the land of Israel. Jerusalem was a city in Israel then, as it is today. And the events that we celebrate at Hanukkah took place in that long-ago Jerusalem and the rough countryside around it. Because the king ruled over many different lands, he ruled many different peoples. They dressed in different ways, spoke different languages, and followed different customs. When they prayed, they prayed to different gods. But the king did not care about the different ways and wishes of his people. He followed Greek ways. So he made laws that said everyone he ruled must wear Greek dress, follow Greek customs, and pray in Greek temples to Greek gods. Do as I say or die, Antiochus said. The troops of Antiochus marched into the beautiful temple the Jews had built in Jerusalem. They destroyed the holy scrolls and books and took the temple's treasure. They even scraped gold from the temple walls. Then they made a Greek temple of the place. Pray as I pray, said Antiochus, or die. Many people were very frightened, so they obeyed the new laws. But there were some who were willing to fight and die for their beliefs. Not far from Jerusalem, in the city of Modin, there was a Jewish priest named Mattathias. He refused to follow the king's laws. When soldiers were sent to force the people to obey, Mattathias was so angry that he killed a Jewish man who did obey the soldiers, and then he killed a soldier. At this point, my mother stops talking. She looks very unhappy. And then she says, even though Matthias was angry at the terrible laws, he was wrong to kill people. Killing does not change the laws. It just brings on more killing. Absolutely, my father said quietly. And Henry and I nodded. My mother continues with the story. After Matthias had killed the two men, he pulled down the altar in the temple of Modin. Then he cried out that everyone who believed as he did should follow him. Of course, he knew that if he did not run, he too would be killed. Many people who also hated the terrible laws followed him. Women, men, and children took their cattle and left their homes to live in the rough hills outside the city. Matthias and his wife took their five sons. Their names were Johanna Gaddis, Simeon Thasi, Judah Maccabee, Eleazar Avara, and Jonathan Aphis. Simeon was the smartest, while Judah was the strongest. When Mattathias died, Judah became the leaders of all the Jewish warriors in the hills. They called themselves Maccabees after him. Maccabee means hammer in Hebrew. And these warriors hammered at their enemy in many battles. Their fame spread. Their lives were very hard, my mother says. Sometimes they did not have enough food. Often they slept on the cold ground. But they were determined to win back the temple in Jerusalem. So they fought on. King Antiochus knew of their strength and their successes. So he put an enormous army together to stop them. Then Judah said to his men, be valiant. Well, that means be brave and strong. They were, and after many, many battles, they took back the great temple on Mount Moriah in Jerusalem. Well, now that should have been a most wonderful time for the Maccabees. They were returning to the place they loved the most in the world after long, difficult years. But the handsome gates had been burned. Rooms and altars were broken down, and there were weeds and rocks everywhere. Everything that had been neat, shining, green and lovely was destroyed and desolate. What did they do? They went to work building, 
cleaning and making the place beautiful again. Then, when the temple was all ready, the priest blessed it and everything that was in it. All this happened on the 25th of Keslev in 164 BC. It is called the rededication of the temple. Rededication means the temple was made holy again and given back to the God of the Jews. Then those who were there lit the menorah and gave thanks and prayed. And now, more than 2,000 years later, we still light the Hanukkah candles and pray in the same way. There is also a story that when the soldiers entered the temple court, they found eight tall spears lying on the ground where they had been hurled. They took the spears and drove them standing straight up into the earth. Then they lit a flame at the top of each one, making the spears look like a candelabra, like the menorah. As long as the Jewish people can remember, it has been very important to always have a flame burning in the temple. This is called the eternal flame. Eternal means lasting forever. In those long ago days, the menorah had seven wicks dipped in oil. But oh, when the Maccabees looked for oil to relight the flame, they found that there was only a tiny bit they could use. Uh, most of it had been spoiled by Antiochus's soldiers. There was only enough good oil left to last for a single day, so the Maccabees were very worried. They were sure the flame would go out because they knew it would take them at least a week to get new oil. But amazingly, that tiny bit of oil lasted for eight days and the flame kept burning. On the eighth day, the good new oil was brought to the temple. And that is why the menorah has places for eight candles and the shamash. It is why we light a candle every night for eight nights, beginning on the 25th of Keslev, the day of rededication. As my mother stops speaking, a few flakes of snow brush the window. We are all very quiet, thinking about the story. Then our dog barks. And my sister wakes up from her nap and the front doorbell rings. My mother asks Henry if he would like to stay for dinner. He would. My father goes to get my sister and I answer the door. My grandmother, Uncle Mort, Aunt Amy, and a couple of snowflakes come in. The dining table has been dressed up for the holiday. The tablecloth and napkins are even whiter than white usually is, and, and the glasses sparkle with the light of candles. Henry and I walk around, looking at our faces reflecting in the spoons and knives. Next to each plate, there is a dreidel and a small package. Those are just little things, my grandmother says. When I was a girl, people didn't give Hanukkah presents at all. Henry and I shake the packages to see if we can tell what's inside them. Henry has never seen a dreidel before. Grandma spins hers. And Henry says, well, it looks like a top with something written on the sides. Exactly, says Grandma. She shows us that the writing is four Hebrew letters one on each side of the dreidel. And they stand for four words. In English, those words mean, a great miracle happened there. Henry wants to know where there is. The land of Israel, says Aunt Amy. And who knows what the miracle was, asks my father. Henry and I smile at each other, we do. He is the guest, so I let him say, it was that the oil lasted for eight nights. We discuss miracles. Henry and I are pretty sure we believe in them. So does Aunt Amy. She thinks 
that a miracle is something wonderful that happens that people cannot explain and only God can make happen. But Uncle Mort thinks that when people cannot explain something amazing, then they call it a miracle. He believes if we all knew enough, everything could be explained scientifically. Grandma doesn't think so. She says that the older she gets, the more things she can think of that cannot be explained in scientific ways. Then, Mother brings in the roast chicken. I like her idea. She says it seems like a miracle to her that tonight we are celebrating something that happened over 2,000 years ago and still has great meaning for us. My Uncle Mort nods. Maybe. It is that combination of past history and present meaning that makes a holiday a holiday, he says. Dinner is delicious. There are potato pancakes called latkes that have been fried in oil to remind us of the special oil. Mother has made donuts for dessert for the same reason. Please pass another one of those miraculous donuts, my father says. They are so light, they probably could fly. Before he takes a bite of his second or third, he wishes everyone a hug, Samiak. I start to tell Henry that those words mean happy holiday in Hebrew, but he has figured that out already and wishes me the same. The snow is falling faster against the window now. The dog is asleep under my father's chair. Every night in this coming week, we will recall the Maccabees and the rededication of the temple. Every night in this coming week, we will add one more candle to the menorah and light the lights again. Every night, as we watch the tallow melt and the small flames die down, we will sit remembering and wondering. Then, we will talk about miracles some more. Do you believe in miracles? Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode of Virtual, a collaborative celebration of the season between 171 and ELT. Whether you are counting down to Christmas, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, or any of the other numerous winter celebrations, 171 Cedar Arts and Elmira Little Theater wish you a happy and safe holiday. If you enjoyed today's show, please share with friends, click like, and subscribe. And if you can, please donate to Elmira Little Theater or 171 Art Center. Links to both our donation pages can be found in the description of today's performance, as well as links to 171 gift certificates. And 171 gift certificates are a great present that provide your loved ones with an experience that will last them a lifetime. Stay safe this holiday season, and thank you for watching. Bye! Bye. Good, Stella. Say it.